You're very welcome to the third episode of the Nevin Economic Research Institute video series. My name is Fiona Duncan. I'm Policy and Communications Manager with Cooperative Housing Ireland. In the first episode, released in May, Dave Gibney of Mandate Trade Union spoke to SIFTU researcher Michael Taft and activist and Mandate member Maren Dalton about banded hours and precarious work in Ireland. Today, similarly, we're going to take a look at worker cooperatives and the role of the trade union movement in encouraging their growth and development in Ireland. To join me to discuss this is Kean McMahon, who is a PhD graduate of the School of Economics in NUI Galway and postdoctoral researcher at St. Mary's University in Nova Scotia, Canada. Keane's recently published PhD entitled The Political Economy of Worker Cooperative Development, Metal and Sustainability, focused on the potential of the worker cooperative model as the basis for a sustainable mode of production. So Keane, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for having um, me on. I thought we might start with the basics. So for those who might be unfamiliar with the term, what is a cooperative? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, a cooperative essentially is, is a business like any other in the sense that it's producing goods and services. Uh, but the difference is that it's kind of owned and democratically controlled uh, by its members. So rather than your conventional investor um, dominated company uh, where money has to vote, so it's the more money you have, the more votes you have, uh, it's it's one member, one vote. Um, now cooperatives come in many forms. You mentioned that I kind of focused on worker cooperatives where the members are the workers within the, w- w- within the company. Uh, in Ireland, it's more common maybe um, to see something like a credit union which is kind of a financial cooperative where the members of the cooperative are the uh, are the people using the financial services saving getting loans uh, the employees of the co- uh, of the credit union might necessarily be members though you you could have the employees as well it would then be a multi-stakeholder cooperative so there's all these different all these different forms we also have agricultural cooperatives in Ireland uh, independent uh, producers of small farmers or even large agri businesses clumping together uh, for, for their mutual benefit. Okay, um, so can you talk to me a bit about the prevalence of cooperatives in Ireland? I know you mentioned that people might be familiar with you know, credit unions and that kind of thing. I think Irish people as well would be very familiar with agricultural cooperatives. Mm. Um, do you know how, how widespread are cooperatives in Ireland or not, as the case may be? I, I think there's like in the region of 1,500 altogether registered cooperatives um, the largest, I think, is credit unions, and, and there's a reason to treat to, treat the 400 um, agricultural co- or cooperatives also uh, quite widespread. I, I think over half, uh, well over half of the population on the entire island are members of cooperatives. Um, so even if people think they're not around, you know, sometimes you're a member of a credit union, you don't realise you're a member of a cooperative. I am probably <laughs> in most of us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> do, so. Um, uh, the uh, agricultural cooperative sector, I think, has in the region of 150,000 members, again, quite widespread in, in, in rural Ireland. Um, my focus, worker cooperatives, um, th- th- there's uh, m- much less, unfortunately, compared to maybe um, countries in continental Europe or, or Latin America, say, places like Italy, Spain, Brazil, Argentina, um, France, even the UK, Scotland, uh, Wales, much um, uh, larger worker co-op sector. So, I mean, at the minute... My kind of guesstimate, because we don't have great up, up, up to date um, uh, c- collection of, of 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 the numbers here, but I, I think it will be in the region of twenty to thirty um, across the island worker cooperatives. Mm. Um, that's a significant decline on on maybe where we were back at the end of the nineties when we had maybe in the region I think it was eighty to ninety or five six hundred workers, but it's nothing like maybe Italy where you have say a million worker members you know and you've, you've got thousands of, of worker co-ops so yeah and do you think um do you think there's anything lacking then in terms of infrastructure to support co-ops I know back in kind of the 80s and 90s there was the cooperative development unit mm. that dissolved in 2002 I think that was quite instrumental in developing worker cooperatives as well as other cooperatives yeah. do you think that there's Maybe, yeah, I suppose a, a gap in terms of support there for cooperatives now in Ireland. Uh, absolutely, in the sense that, I mean, in 1980, I think there was four worker cooperatives across the whole island. And it wasn't really until some of that infrastructure got put in place, the cooperative development unit, which was, was in force. And that was a point a point of contention and uh, at the time, whether that was the best place for it, rather than an independent unit, um, maybe state representation as well as trade unions and, and the rest. But... The cooperative development unit that was there was a, an initiative that came out of the first social partnership agreement, which I think is 1987, um, and it was it was the trade union side uh, pushing that the um, 
think it would have been the Federated Workers' Union of, of Ireland at the time, which had their own cooperative unit, uh, the Workers' unit, Unity Trust, within uh, the, 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 the trade union. Um, so you, you had the trade union putting resources in, into a unit to give uh, financial, legal, technical support uh, to people interested in setting up cooperatives. Um, and some of this experience then pushed in, in, into force and they provided similar sorts of services. Uh, there was a lot of learning as you do, um, like any business, business initiatives, there was, there was failures, but there was also a lot of successes which, which people don't tend to talk about. And that's unfortunate because there seems to be a view within the Irish labour movement that we've tried all that and, and it kind of all failed. And I, I don't think that's quite fair on, 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 on the, those per- participants. Yeah. yeah, OK, so there is a real kind of dearth of support there in your view yeah i i mean the the, the irish worker co-op develop uh, worker co-op movement if you like grew and uh, fell if you like along with the the, the the support of infrastructure yeah yeah okay uh, we'll move on to a bit more discussion on trade unions later on in the discussion but just to kind of go to discuss your thesis so you mentioned the, the term metal and that's you know it's within your title um so can you explain the term metal to me i know it's an irish word but insofar as it relates to co-ops sure yeah. th- th- that was kind of my way of trying to appeal to kind of the shared irish history of cooperation in, in the sense that the metal in rural ireland was tradition goes back hundreds not thousands of years i don't know but it, it, it certainly goes back a long way uh, in, the, in that rural communities, when, when it will come to the harvest, uh, the neighbours will come in and, and all, kind of, uh, di- all kind of dig in. And likewise, then, w- when it came your turn, your neighbours will come. And there will be kind of a, you know, the sing-song and a few jars and a whole cultural thing yeah. around it. Um, and then the term metal grew out of that, I think, I think to mean something more broadly in, in kind of cooperation to meet social need. Um, and that, that's very deeply rooted in, in, in kind of Irish history, going back to kind of Breton law and go to James Connolly, things like the Ralhine Commune and thinkers like William Thompson and that, that whole history, the Limerick Soviet people are talking about a lot these days. Yeah. And indeed the, um, the agricultural cooperatives, which were, were such a kind of nearly the economic basis of the Irish independence movement, a recent book by Patrick Doyle goes into this and it's a kind of ignored history. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay, okay. So um, just to move us forward a little bit into, I suppose, the current day. So you mentioned um, the crisis of neoliberal capitalism in your PhD. Um, And I'm not sure if you're referring to it as maybe um, presenting an opportunity for the development of of worker cooperatives or cooperatives in general in Ireland. Um, Many of our listeners might be familiar with the the quote from Milton Friedman, whether or not we agree with his ideas or not, but I suppose that only a crisis actual or perceived produces real change and that, you know, what happens depends on the ideas that are lying around at the time. So do you think that, you know, the current global financial crisis or the, you know, well, some would say it's not current anymore, but I suppose the time that we find ourselves in now, do you think that presents an opportunity for the growth and development of worker cooperatives in Ireland or not? No, no, I do. I do. Yeah. I think in Ireland, and I think uh, globally, frankly, I, I, I mean, cooperatives have kind of always been, t- to my mind, kind of self-help kind of institution of of, of, of working people. I mean, you go back to the, the Rockdale pioneers, um, set up the first kind of consumer co-ops, they were trade union, trade unionists, you know, and it's usually in times of crisis when you need the most self-help, um, growing unemployment and. So, so certainly it pre- presents opportunities. All of a sudden, people are looking for alternatives, and they, they see a kind of um, a failure of, of business as usual and, and uh, of the system that's that that's been there. Uh, the difference maybe today from maybe the last kind of significant kind of structural crisis um, in kind of economics and politics and culture, if you like, back in the the, the kind of 70s, 1980s, mm. you see the rise of Thatcher Reagan against kind of social democracy. Uh, the, the difference now really is that was a crisis where, if anything, from capitalism's perspective, the labour movement was too strong. You know, there was yeah. falling profits and uh, Thatcher and Reagan was to discipline, you know, the working class essentially and, and restore profitability. Uh, right now we have a, a crisis, uh, if anything, which is coming from workers being too weak. Mm. Or that was, certainly that was the genesis of the 2007-2008. Um, you had stagnant wages and growing growing debt, but you know, to be very it's simplistic a about context, it. Yeah, there's a d- different context in that now the, the, the labour movement is, 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 is trying to rebuild uh, th- that strength like back in the 1930s. It's, tr- you know, it's, tr- it's trying to um, develop and 
worker cooperatives and workplace democracy, I would see is nearly an extension of strong trade unionism. So I, I think maybe we, we shouldn't think see co-ops as a kind of magic bullet in that, you know, we, we can just ignore all this old stuff about organising workers and trade unions or social movements mm-hmm. or political parties. Um, if anything, the cooperatives will be an extension of that, but we should be thinking uh, thinking now strategically about um, what we can do at these early stages mm-hmm. um, so that a few years down the line um, that maybe we can have a real shot at, at, at growing the movement again. Okay. Um... Yeah, um, and I suppose just to go back to your earlier discussion on the trade union movement, what do you believe the trade union movement can do for cooperatives in Ireland? Are there any kind of practical ways by which the trade union movement can can support the cooperatives? Do you think the trade union movement understand um, cooperatives and worker cooperatives in particular? Um, is there an awareness there? Is there an understanding? Is there Are there maybe some misconceptions out there that you're aware of? Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that... Certainly, I think there's been a, a loss of kind of uh, understanding and awareness of, of cooperatives, the role they can play in the relationship uh, between the trade union movement, not just in, in the Irish labour movement, but uh, I, I, th- I think globally too. So I think that's where I would start and what can be done would be in, in raising awareness and particularly the role of, of trade, union, trade union education. I mean, it's, it's kind of widely accepted I think within the movement that there needs to be a, a move you know away from a servicing kind of individual model of trade unionism to an organizing model and par, you know a, a, a sub kind of component of that is moving from uh, trade union education that focuses on individual rights to um, more of a kind of political economy education you know uh, what's the workers place within this capitalist system we live in what's the dynamics of that system what kind of alternatives can we start to build to, to, to counter um, mm. to counter some of the kind of nefarious aspects of that system and um, so that would be the the first place to start um, yeah. and be, there is some of that going on with the likes of trademark I know absolutely they do great work in yeah, tra- trademark be, belfast yeah. have been doing yeah. and i mean some of the they've helped set up some worker cooperatives in belfast and they've come out of some of their educational programs which kind of goes to to prove the point to some to, yeah. to, to, to some degree, but I mean you can, you know you can put some financial resources or you can make some legal changes and all these kind of supports that do exist in countries with large cooperative movements. But until there's an awareness and a cultural appreciation and practice of cooperativism, uh, they, you know they're not just going to fall out of the sky. You know someone someone has to do it, and these changes at a structural level in terms of finance and legal changes and. Uh, that's not the place to start for me, though it is centrally important it's to scaling important, the movement. Yeah. Uh, and at this stage, you can be thinking about what kind of policies will need to be implemented um, a, a, alongside doing these um, educational initiatives. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, so there is there is some work being done there, I suppose, in yeah, your view, but there's, and I think even, as Bertie said, a lot. Yeah, a lot lot more to do. Yeah, to yeah, do. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think you, the SIPTU College also are, are reorient, reorienting their economics program. We've been involved in some of this, but it's to move more back in a political economy direction, and there's maybe potential in in, in there to do to do similar things. Um, but I'd also say, you know, tra- trade union since they're kind of embedded in workplaces by by their ve- very nature, they have certain capacities to support cooperatives, maybe that the state doesn't even have. Um, so, for example, you would have uh, kind of sector kind of specific consultancy capacities within trade unions. Uh, you have the ability to raise fi- finance off your members. That's what the Workers' Unity Trust was in the FWUI. Uh, you put a levy on the, the union dues and, and, and you build up a trust. Mm-hmm. You can provide finance and you set up a unit to provide um, technical support. So you've got that basis in the workplace and you're, you're, you're organising workers together collectively. And if you're doing that in a kind of devolved cooperative way, it's kind of putting in the groundwork for the kind of things that those workers would have to do in the setting of a cooperative business. Yeah, so, so the principles and ethos are very similar. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, in some senses, you could th- you can nearly think of a trade union as a cooperative. It's a one member, one vote um, institution that serves its members' interests. Um, you know, cooperatives are there to meet the needs of the members rather than to produce profit as such. Mm-hmm. I mean, profit is kind of a, a means rather than an end. Yeah, so it's perhaps you could say maybe less of a leap for a trade union member to join or start a worker cooperative, you know, in the ideal um, scenario. Uh, absolutely, that because you should not be de- a trade union member. Yeah, because you should be developing that that cooperativist culture. Uh, you know, if if you're going to be an effective 
trade union movement um, amongst the, the grassroots and there's not a very big leap from sitting in at a, at a union, union meeting and participating and you know building your confidence and going into a cooperative kind of business setting yeah so, yeah. yeah yeah okay um and can you name some examples of collaboration between co-ops and trade unions outside of ireland you know mm. are there examples that we can learn from yeah interestingly right now what, what i'm aware of is in in the in the states um the the USW, I think, is it the Steelworkers Union under under Leo Gerard have, have started an initiative with, and this is going back a couple of years maybe, but with the Mondragon Cooperative uh, in, in the Basque region, which is kind of seen as the, I guess, the flagship. It's a, a kind of very large conglomerate with, I, I think, um, certainly in the region of 80,000 employees, I think, mm. uh, last last I checked, um, working across um, various industries and at a kind of high technical capacity. It's very, very impressive yeah. work or cooperative it's always operation. Held up as the, yeah, the, the, one the of the best of, examples. One of the best now. It's, yeah. it's, it's not beyond criticism, but, yeah. you know, there's a, a, a lot to be learned from it, I think, too. And Mondragon have been working and are learning, too, from the Steelworkers Union, but on what they're calling a union co op model. And uh, this is really to try to see what, what uh, place is there for for trade unions within cooperatives. I mean, you've got rid of the antagonism between the boss as such and mm-hmm. uh, and the workers, and that the workers become their own directors and their own boss. Uh, but if you, if you're talking about a large cooperative like many of the Mondragon um, worker co-ops, the larger the co-op, the more lines of management you're go- you're going to have. I mean, it's a general relationship. Some co-ops are more horizontal, some are more ver- vertical. But you're going to need some degree of coordination, if not kind of hierarchical top-down management, and that's going to inevitably um, bring into conflict the the workers' position as a as a kind of owner member mm. and the workers' position as a worker. You know, there might yeah. be things that they disagree with individually that they want to bring to the trade union so there's a there's a role for trade unions um i think in there now that worker co-ops are growing in the states i'm not sure that model has taken off big time so far um but there are examples maybe say in the uk of uh, very productive relationships with trade unions and, and worker co-ops uh the most prominent would be i think suma whole foods which is uh, i think again the kind of uh, leading light in the uk it's it's, it's been around since I think, 1977 over 40 years uh, I think it has over 200 uh, worker members and they're all paid equally. Interestingly, they do a lot of um, uh, kind of job rotation and it's a very democratic, radical kind of uh, it, worker co-op experience. And they, they um, got in touch with the Bakers Union and the Bakers, they, they're unionized within the Bakers Union. And uh, they have a very interesting relationship where the trade union will work uh, alongside, you know, alongside the, the co-op. Uh, and it will only you know cross the table when you have uh, have these disputes but they found a very productive role for both sides the union promotes worker co-ops now and the worker co-op promotes unionizing cooperatives yeah well wow. okay so there are a lot of examples that we can yeah, kind of learn use, from yeah. learn from um just as you mentioned mondragon there so as i said it's often as and as you were saying it's often held up as one of the best examples of of uh, worker cooperative um economy in action um, and I suppose a lot of people would say that it would have weathered the storm of the global financial crisis quite well and mm-hmm. um, they managed to you know keep unemployment at I think half the national level um, around kind of 2008-2009 so I suppose is it your view that worker cooperatives are perhaps more resilient than other kind of enterprises um, in terms of I suppose economic uh, crisis? Yeah I think because of I suppose the reason I alluded to earlier that the focus or the kind of main goal of, of a worker co-op isn't the profit in itself. The, the, the yeah. profit in a worker co-op is the job, you know. And so if you have a situation, maybe a crisis situation where a cooperative is really struggling in terms of profitability, maybe it's just about breaking even, if at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, where in a conventional setting, a, a business owner might say that this just isn't worth the effort anymore. In a worker co-op, if you're about breaking even, you're still getting your wage, you know, you're, you're happy to plug away and you're happy to maybe, you know, make, make some collective sacrifices that you mightn't even, this can get dodgy, but you mightn't even be allowed to do within a conventional company. You might collectively decide to lower wages or you might just um, all, all work less hours or there's all different uh, work, work sharing uh, arrangements uh, that can come into play. So there's flexibilities is, is what I'm trying to say yeah. w- within the model. And 
um, it, it just means that they can kind of weather weather the storm a little better. So there will be evidence from, say, Spain and France and Italy, uh, as you mentioned, Mondragon is as one example. Um, though I think it, it had some failures during the crisis, but it it was able to um, compensate. But in these countries, there is evidence that the, the worker co-op sectors there, which are relatively large, um, the, the, the worker co-op survived a much higher survival rate uh, during the crisis yeah. for, for these kinds of reasons. And in terms of how workers are treated, I suppose, within worker cooperatives, I suppose there's more flexibility in terms of, say, for example, in, you know, in normal, um, in normal companies, you know, disciplinary processes, someone loses their job at the end of that, possibly. Whereas I know in the case of Mondragon, unless I'm mistaken, you know, if someone is finding their job isn't suiting them, they're, they're moved on to another job. Basically, people aren't, there's a real kind of um, push to, to keep employment at as high levels as again, possible. Yeah, you know? Again, that the, the employment is the profit and that's what everything's built and that's what the support structures are built around. I mean, yeah. Mondragon had a particularly notable failure during the crisis which was their I think it was their kind of white goods manufacturing arm which was one of the first worker co-ops set up I think it's called Figore and that, that, that basically failed and they tried to pump I mean Mondragon works like a kind of um, uh, a kind of second tier cooperative it brings together individual worker cooperatives and they all give a little bit of autonomy up to the the, 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 the second tier cooperative if you like um, so when one gets into trouble, the other cooperatives kind of might put some resources, right. might be, yeah. a decision might be made at that higher level. And they tried that in Mondragon, but they, they really found that uh, it, it was just too much. Uh, the white goods industry, maybe globalization and everything, um, it, it just wasn't going to survive. But what they did do was that uh, there was very good protections in terms of, you, you know, the, the source of protection um, uh, regime at, at the company but also that as you say they would have shifted the workers who didn't want to just take redundancy or whatever into other yeah. cooperatives and they could redeploy their skills and retrain Mondragon have their own university built up you know so um, and that's the kind of the, the idea of cooperation amongst cooperatives even rather than simply uh, competing with each other in a, in a market setting. Yeah so it's looking yeah. at the collective well-being of workers as opposed to you know the individual. Absolutely which is, yeah. Um, yeah. Which is great. Um, I suppose in terms of precarious employment, so we did discuss this in the first episode of the video series, so we've seen a huge rise in uh, the precarious in Ireland and people often refer to employers such as Deliveroo in this regard. Do you think that worker cooperatives have the potential to, I suppose, respond to this rise in precarious employment? Yeah, well, I, I think particularly, I mentioned, you mentioned Deliveroo and that kind of whole platform area. I mean, there's a lot of worry about the future work and technological change. And, you know, some of it, I think, is, is, is um, yeah, it's a, it's a worry, but some of it can be can be overblown too in the sense that, okay, these tech technologies as it stands are, are being used to kind of uh, re- remove the face of the employer from the workers and disperse the workers. And it's very hard for them to organize from a trade union perspective. But those technologies could also be used in a cooperative setting uh, to benefit those workers um, mm. v- v- uh, very much. So I think the idea of platform cooperatives is going a lot now and the international cooperative organisations um, are, are pushing this. More broadly, pre- precarious work, and I, I've never been convinced by this whole thing of you know this new dangerous class of the precarious. I, I think mm. precarious workers are just unorganised traditional working class, basically. Um, yeah. And I kind of take a lead from the American sociologist and Beverly Silver, who kind of sees that precarious workers today are, are potentially kind of tomorrow's um, settled working class that we traditionally associate with manufacturing and industrialization. Mm. And certainly kind of in in the West, that's been kind of unmade or in the global north, maybe it's better that that, that that working class has been unmade and is kind of on the back foot. But actually, a lot of the strikes we're seeing today are, are in kind of services, precarious workplaces uh, that we were told couldn't be organised or it was too difficult. And um, and that's where the militancy is happening now. And I think it's, it's, it's again, cooperatives are an extension of strong trade unions. And I think if, if, the, if the services sector um, builds, up a, builds up a stronger uh, uh, trade union organisation, you'll start to see cooperatives emerge in those sectors. Already in Ireland in the north, I mentioned Trademark, there was a cleaning cooperative, Belfast Cleaning Cooperative. There was an initiative, uh, Union Taxis, 
you, you know yeah. again there can be a lot of rogue kind of um, nearly bogus self-employment going on uh, in, in those sectors obviously construction um, and uh, they the creative arts you know the creative workers cooperative in Belfast too so that's actually where it's already happening and I think that's uh, so some of the reasoning there is that it's the services sector where workers are starting to to, to really um they've had enough and uh, they're starting to organize and they're starting to think you know how can we um do this ourselves yeah and i suppose yeah i mean your view on the rise of the precarious often people would say you know we've had a precarious workforce for years you know if you think mm-hmm. of the dock workers you turn up for your day at work you may, sure. may or may not be employed for the day so there is an argument to be made in that regard um you mentioned i suppose the service industry there uh, there is there has been a huge growth um, as far as i'm aware in care cooperatives in the states so care work so i suppose mm. um, quite um, feminized um, i suppose sectors of employment and um, i think over 70 percent of worker cooperatives now are made up um, of women in the states so would you think that's um, something that that's maybe a potential for represents potential for growth maybe of worker cooperatives in Ireland. Yeah, I think in Italy too there's a lot of social cooperatives that engage in kind of child care and elder care and the rest. But I just urge a little bit of caution on this front in that, and I think this has been a problem in Italy to some degree. Sometimes th- this is a um, a step along the way to nearly a kind of full privatisation of what probably should be um, state services. Uh, something provided by the state in the first place and I mean cooperatives sometimes you know they 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 can only be as I said interested in their members primarily you know and um, if they're not a worker cooperative uh, you know they they might be treating their employees quite badly and uh, there's been some trade union disputes in the UK recently so these things could arise and in a care setting we've seen recently with the um with the floor over child care here here in Ireland um, how moving these services away from the state and in, into pr- private hands because a cooperative is a private collective that can be dangerous and I think in the UK they, when David Cameron and co were pushing cooperatives uh, they were doing so maybe in a disingenuous man- manner that we're going to outsource these state services to cooperatives um, and then when the tender comes back around they give it to their friends over in, mm. in whatever pri- pri- conventional private uh, healthcare company or whatever so I, I think we need to be careful about that one and think you know what exactly are we producing some things are better left uh under the state some things can be done uh with that private autonomy a private collective um, and we just need to be careful that we don't think everything needs to be worker cooperatives at least as traditionally understood sure so you'd urge a bit of caution there yeah yeah i think you know the idea of social cooperatives would even be be to bring on, uh, say, the parents of children onto the governance of the cooperative, more of a multi-stakeholder model. But a state enterprise is ultimately kind of a multi-stakeholder model, um, in, in terms of the citizens. Of the, the state, yeah, it's a huge, it's a huge, yeah. co- and I think that's how we should think about exactly. um, state uh, state companies mm. as huge cooperatives. And how can we internally even cooperativize their op- operations? Can we give workers more uh, participation? That was a, a huge thing back in the seventies and eighties. That's been kind of lost what's the role for worker directors and sub boards these days and workers councils and um, so we need to go back to that too and, and think how can we how can we think of a, a worker cooperative as a state um enterprise yeah. yeah okay um there's just to move on to i suppose a different aspect of discussion there's been a lot of debate in recent years um within the trade union movement but also within wider society on climate justice um, and just transition for workers in industries such as, um, you know, work, working in the bogs. You know, there's been huge changes in Board mm. um and other similar industries. And I know you refer to Board Mona in your thesis, actually. Um, and you mentioned the um, existence of worker cooperatives in the 80s and 90s within Board Mona itself. Mm. But I, do you think that the model of worker cooperatives should form part of a programme for just transition? Is there scope for... Um, for some work in that regard yeah I think there's there, there's definitely scope again some of the what I've said about care also uh, applies to the environment there again mm. do you want to turn board and owner into uh, private collectives of workers rather than a state uh, entity where I, I mean uh, as you said I, I kind of studied this a little bit back in the late 80s that board and owner brought in uh, a, a lot of worker participation and um, kind of a uh, worker cooperative kind of structures they they had um worker 
directors at a board level they had workers at a kind of work council level sub board level and then they also had the people out on the bog organized into autonomous enterprise units which were essentially little worker cooperatives um, and right. as if they were within mondragon within that bigger structure they they, yeah. they run the, 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 the little team themselves but they give some autonomy to the company as well so it's very um, radical really yeah it was yeah. A, a kind of ra- a radical way to think about how and the company was in trouble at the time and and, and these reforms um got bored and Mona, um b- b- back in health but but it was mm-hmm. uh it, it was a way that that brought a lot of worker grassroots worker ideas to the table and there was some kind of even initiatives like lock boring and awfully there kind of recreational things and environmental kind of regeneration ideas could come out of those who, who are at the, the coal face um, as such yeah um and more broadly you would think that cooperatives given the values of kind of concern for community and solidarity equality that they should be a bit more attuned to um environmental concerns at least potentially uh, a good example in ireland would be the key cooperative in in, in cork which is the the currently the longest uh, surviving worker co-op i think it's 35 years or so it's been a worker co-op and that's a vegetarian restaurant and mm. whole foods and, and that's a consumer cooperative as well um it, or no I, I think initially it started out in the early 80s as a community cooperative and it was really just to get a space for um social movement uh groups such as uh, you know feminist activists environmental activists gay and lesbian activists and they they, they would rent out a building and eventually they started um kind of doing the vegetarian restaurant just to pay for the building and over time they decided rather than just paying in as a community member if you're going to be a member of this cooperative you have to be working you know you know they were putting a lot of voluntary labor in and all the rest are going to have to be a worker in here okay um so they they do have their and i i mean i did ask them um, in terms that they think about bringing their consumers on and stuff but there hasn't been any um big change to their structure since then but they, they certainly the, their whole ethos and and their whole reason to be is to kind of serve the community and serve the environmental uh, purpose. So you could, and they kind of said to me, how could we have done what we wanted to do in any other sort of conventional structure? You know, sort of something maybe uh, inherent to I think the cooperative model that at least potentially uh, fits with environmental sustainability. Mm-hmm. Uh, though that's not always the case. Um, if the workers don't, if they don't um, extend their solidarity beyond the the confines of the the business if you like if they if they don't start even informally bringing community um dialogue and representation into the company i think that's what the key call do they do it informally rather than formally yeah but i suppose at the same time you don't want to place too much responsibility on worker cooperatives to solve all of the ills of the world absolutely there's going to need to be a kind of planned state investment and done in a way that 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 um involves community as as much as possible but it's a macro issue and a small worker cooperative even a larger worker cooperative can't account for for those macro issues you need someone that that's stepping back that can only be done i think at the, at, at the state level and indeed at the interstate level uh, sure. yeah yeah um okay so just moving on to culture so it's something that you mentioned a bit in your thesis so you referred to the kind of the concept of boss culture um so i suppose it's the idea of kind of deference i suppose mm. to um, authority maybe that we have in ireland um, so it's either deference or indifference depending on kind of what way you're looking at it um can you explain a bit about that to me and kind of how you think it might impact on our um our i suppose willingness to think about wor- a worker cooperative uh, yeah. model as being kind of something uh, realistic i guess in an, in an irish context some of this i mean there's kind of a deference to authority in general traditionally you know uh, through maybe yeah, the, the role of the church and uh, I, I guess um, uh, you know post or neo-colonialism or, or whatever in, in the state that that arose there which was kind of aligned to the church and so that, that kind of filters into to people's uh, views and their, their, their culture of, of work too um, and the, that term boss culture comes from Latin America where maybe there were certain countries would have been similar issues between dictatorships and between um uh, between religious institutions and um, those such institutions can potentially play a progressive role as they do in italy and there's a the churches in italy are are are, are, are support have a cooperative federation mm-hmm. um but yeah the, the really my emphasis on, on culture in my thesis 
was to was to try to get at this this idea that I alluded to earlier that if we were to change the the, the structures in terms of law and finance and everything the, through policy initiatives to support worker co-ops someone needs to do it they're not going to come come from nowhere and I think until we have a political culture um, that's kind of cooperativist within our trade unions within our political parties um, within our folk organisations within our churches civil society then n- n- nothing huge is going to happen and that, that needs to develop first you know and that can be done through education I think within, within those institutions and, and practice within those institutions such as trade unions and um, first of all are, are we going to devolve power to our grassroots trade union members and uh, give them more confidence in, in themselves and more, more democratic participation and th- then if we create an awareness that worker co-ops are there well then all of a sudden when opportunities arise there's people who are ready to ready, intervene yeah. yeah ready to intervene and that's what happened in the that's that's what happened in the in the 70s and 80s even where there wasn't an awareness there was a confidence amongst workers just to you know the chronic cooperative uh, in me the furniture co- furniture cooperative uh, was going 30 years i think uh, before before it closed but that was a worker occupation in the 70s and they these would have been trade unionists now but they they took over took over the building and they start running it as a as a worker co-op you know it's and it's something that nearly when that cultural political cultural shift happens it nearly happens spontaneously and whether you've made a change to the laws regulating cooperatives or whether there was finance there, they find ways around all, all, all those structural issues. Yeah. Um, but the most important thing is that they want to do it, they, they know they can do it, um, and they have the confidence in themselves. Yes, yeah, so it's a literal seizing of the means of production, basically. You know, yeah, I mean, that's that yeah. what they did, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, so, um, and that's what they do in, in Argentina during the crisis. They just, they, they had that confidence that, you know, we're old wages and redundancy, we're going to occupy... Uh, this factory, the recovered enterprise movement in Argentina, we're going to occupy this factory. You're not going to take out the machinery. The community have rallied around us because they have that broader culture and awareness of what we're trying to do. Um, and uh, we're going to argue our case in the courts and against the government. And if you try to kick us out, you're, you're, you're going to have them to answer to as well as us. So, yeah. uh, you know, that's um, no, that's not the only way you can set up a cooperative, you know, but if you're talking about scaling the movement and taking advantage of, of crises, if we're to appropriate our friend uh, Milton Friedman there, yeah. then that's, that's what you're talking about. Yeah. So do you think what's holding us back then in Ireland collectively is, I suppose, a fear of responsibility and a fear of um, owning our own work? Is that, is that yeah, what you mean by boss culture? Abs- yeah. uh, absolutely. That's it. You know, even some of the cooperatives that have been set up in Belfast, they've had trouble trying to get the right people in who are, who, who, who again are, they, they kind of get it, you know, they, they, they get cooperatives and, and they understand what it's about and they understand the responsibilities rather than when something goes wrong, you know, they're turning looking for the manager or the boss, that's the kind of boss culture, something's gone wrong, who do I know, this is something we, we, we've got to do, you know, this is something we've got to deal with. And I mean, you can understand too that, you know, a, a lot of workers may maybe they're, they're they're happy in to to a, to a degree in the security of what they know in having someone call call the shots and you get your wage at the end of the week and and, and you go off and that there's a security there and we're we're creatures of of habit, you know. Uh, but if you're to really improve people's well being, it's about breaking down some of those bar- barriers and that, that that alienation. Yeah, and I suppose the same could maybe be said of. How the trade union movement operates currently, obviously in the in the context it finds itself in, it is quite um I suppose uh, um I suppose the relationship isn't obviously symbiotic between the between workers and employers. So I suppose trade unions have a, a specific way of kind of going about business. And do you think you know if we were to find ourselves in a utopia of worker cooperatives, obviously trade unions would have to kind of you know, change how they do things and change how they view. Yeah, I mean, going back to the example of of Suma earlier on, you know, they they mentioned that the Bakers Union and and, and Suma have, have quite a good relationship, generally speaking, and and, and the trade union work with them on, on different aspects. You know, you can work with them on education, or you can work with them, uh, and and then when there's a dispute, okay, we're on opposite sides of the table. It's a slightly yeah. different, you, you know. Okay, you can have you know enterprise partnership relationships and, and all the rest but there's this there's just a slightly different relationship and i think um um what exactly the, 
the role that trade unions are going to play within the enterprise and that's kind of foreign maybe to trade unionists um, yeah. in a setting where there's very little work or co-ops um, but, but as I said maybe examples like SUMA can, can be learned from um, not, not to think that trade unions are going to disappear or something as, as I said in cooperatives uh, there's going to be there's going to be a need for there's going to be a need for trade unions particularly in larger cooperatives um, and you know it, it's joining a trade union is itself an extension of a cooperative ethos that reaches beyond the enterprise you don't just join a trade union because uh, you know you're getting individual benefits you join it because you're becoming part of a social movement that's that's there to reshape society at large and you're making a contribution your cooperative is making a contribution as much as you're, you're receiving a protection you know and that's the way it should be viewed rather than you know well you know we don't have any disputes here so we shouldn't join yeah. a trade union and, yeah 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 it's kind of like know, a thing you know yeah, yeah. i won't get a smoke alarm because i've never had a fire Ex- exactly you know? You yeah. know, so that's yeah yeah, yeah okay um, so um just for those interested in taking a read where can we get our hands on your phd is it online or sure so it's, it's available online um if, if anyone wants to put themselves through that at the um the Aaron repository uh, at, online at NUI Galway. So that's the access to research at NUI Galway, I think that stands for. But if they go in and they just search for, uh, I think, worker cooperatives, it's probably going to be the only result that comes up. But my name, Key McMatten, political economy of worker cooperative development, and, and they'll have, have access to, to that. Yeah. Particularly the Irish case studies will be of interest. The, the, the um, uh, chapter five, where, where the, 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 the worker cooperators away. give me their story, you know, and, and I try to. To, to, to give that back so uh, yeah. brilliant um, and then in terms of your move to Nova Scotia now um, what are you planning to look at or have you have you thought that far ahead or obviously you're going to be studying worker cooperatives I imagine in Canada it's actually going to be co- cooperatives m- more generally um, okay. I'm going to be based in what's the International Centre for Cooperative Management um, the Seoul Business School in St Mary's University and uh, the the, the the focus on management there is kind of trying to shift management within cooperatives of all types towards a more humanistic model, which I often get like in many NGOs or God forbid in some trade unions, is that sometimes the employees within there um, aren't always treated as well as you would expect given yeah. the social mission of those organisations. Um, so what we're really try- trying to promote there is, is the idea that within a credit union, for example, you know, are you treating employees just like any other high street bank treats employees? And because of this, are you foregoing some of the potential of the cooperative movement, the pro- productivity, efficiency benefits that come from that come from giving workers a say, uh, those at uh, at the call face of the operation who who know the business a say, um, in in how it's how it's run. So that can be done in lots of ways. It can be done through unionising the cooperative. It can be done through bringing the cooperative on as. As, as, as members or board level per- participation but it's really about bringing workplace democracy into all forms of, of cooperatives and I think that's what we're trying to um, prom- promote and explore um, uh, presuming it's a good thing when, when we do explore it. Brilliant yeah. so Excellent. thanks very much Keen. Um, I think at this point we'll wrap things up but uh, just to say thanks a million for coming in to speak with us on this important topic today um, and thank you to our viewers and listeners um, and best of luck Keen, in your move to Canada um, as mentioned previously Neary are open to any ideas and suggestions that you might have for future episodes so feel free to get in touch on info at thank you for listening